a dungeon. Welcome to Cauldron Script. I'm your host, Master Cauldron. If you're new to the show, we use our combined 30 years of experience to dispel myths, get rid of stereotypes, and answer your questions about BDSM. You can call in at 865-268-4005 to leave your questions or visit the crypt at cauldronscrypt.com. On this episode of The Crypt, we're going to dive into BDSM and the law, but first I have to welcome my amazing co-host, Fun Size. Hello, Fun Size. Hello, Master Cauldron. You are full of spunk and energy today. Oh, I am. I really, really am. (laughs) This is a topic, as you know, working in the mental health field, I also worked with commitment cases and sat in on thousands of hearings, plus my own personal legal battles over the years. Nothing criminal, thankfully. But this is certainly a topic. One of my best friends is a lawyer. We discuss law constantly. In fact, before I went into the psych field, I was strongly considering becoming an attorney. So. I'm always beating him up with questions. So this is something that I really, really get into. And with that said, let me hit these rules to love by so we can get into the meat of what we're talking about today. And as I said, BDSM in the law. So rules to love by rule number one, safe, sane, consensual and informed rule number two, kinky. That's K N K I. That comes from the kinky app available on all platforms and stands for knowledge, no intolerance, kindness and integrity. And rule number three, that quote from Mr. Paul Young, submission is not about authority and it's not about obedience. It is all about relationships of love and respect. And if you are new to the show, those rules to love by comes from some of the earliest episodes and things that we just find very important in any type of relationship, whether it's BDSM, vanilla, friendship, it applies to all of them. All right. So as we all know, the law can be a very sticky subject and it's there to help protect us if we get caught up in it. It's not so pleasant, but today's conversation, we do have a few things to look at. And I think probably where we need to go first is defining without exactly defining. So what are the laws that we directly face as part of the kink community or lifestyle? Here in the majority of the U.S., and most of this episode does talk about laws here in America, because unfortunately, there's just so many international laws and so many laws that differ by country alone that it would literally take us the rest of the season talking about it every hour of every day just to cover. So the laws we're looking at are from the majority of the U.S., and at present, there's a common law which states that a person cannot consent to being harmed. In theory, this would negate all consent of BDSM practices and generally make everything we do illegal. That's a theory, though. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And before we get too thick into the woods with this one, a disclaimer here, we do have to point out uh, myself nor fun size is an attorney. So all of this is things that have been found through research and personal experience, but not through actual legal education or services of our own. So we are not attorneys. And if you have deeper questions than what we cover, normally I say come to us and ask. But in this case, I'm going to say contact a local attorney that's going to know the laws more specifically in your state. With that said, back into this. So how are we going to how would you break down some of these common laws? I would start by breaking down this particular common law by digging into its wording. Law is really very specific on its wording. If you look into legal matters, you'll notice that most terms, almost every sentence, every word has a definition that's very specific for it. So I'm going to use that kind of for and against it. This law states that one cannot consent to being harmed. Well, there's a huge difference between hurt and harm, and we're actually going to be doing a future episode on just that topic, because that's a huge one for both of us, I know. Mm, certainly is. Yes. And what it really comes down to is that we, as consenting adults, each have to define the line between hurt and harm ourselves. So in that, we can consent to something. <laughs> and 
then my second huge point on the wording of this is that it seems to be aimed at those who engage in impact play. And as we all know, impact play is not a must for BDSM. It's just a very general statement. It's a very general common law. And in that sense, it's very faulty. However, even with all this confusing and ill-worded generalization, there is one good point to be made, and that is that this law also helps to protect those who have been abused. This common law is actually what allows the victims of abuse to move into criminal charges against their abusers for assault or aggravated assault. Yeah, and a lot of people jumping back to the uh, the impact play. I think that's the two most common misconceptions about BDSM is that one, it's sexual, two, it's all impact play. But that's just a very small part of it. And I point that out because if it's something that people are concerned about within their own community, if they live in an extremely strict community, that this happens to be the current focus of law enforcement, there is all kinds of pleasure that can come out of a DS relationship that has nothing to do with impact play and since it's your own personal relationship obviously sex can be involved in there but as we will come to find out later in this episode uh not all sex is legal (laughs) and i'm not just talking about the rapey kind (laughs) all right one of the things that gets me is the band that a lot of communities will have and these laws that ban many of the BDSM activities as morally reprehensible, especially living here in the Bible Belt. They are very strict on it. In fact, I'd mentioned in an earlier episode, I believe, where the lady was killed. She lived in a house as a slave. There was three other, three or four other slaves within this house and, of course, a master and And she was tied in the kitchen and beaten to death. And part of the defense was that it was BDSM activity. And I was so proud to hear from, it was Clarks, I believe Clarksville, Tennessee, this small town judge comes out and says, no, no, that's giving the BDSM community a bad name. This was abuse. This was murder. This was not BDSM activity. And so there are these small little pushes that we're getting in the right direction. And I love that. It energizes me. It gives me a little bit of hope. But for the most part, especially here in the Bible Belt, everything's just looked at in such a negative light. But moving on here, one of the things that is so interesting, and I love that you point this out when you're getting this together, doing this research, is these laws can not only affect what you do, but also what you own how many toys that you may own. And in some cases, they're just against the law. You can't possess a flogger. Or even in the more vanilla sense, you cannot own a phallic shaped toy. I'll say it that way. Yes. Uh, And that's uh, what types of implements you can have. And even the kinds of sex that you can be having, as I just mentioned, sodomy, for an example, is illegal. I know you say in Montana Mm -hmm. as well as my home state of Montana, as well as in most states. And in most of the southern states, the missionary position is actually the only legal way to have sex. And most of those states also in the laws go so far as to say that it is, quote, only with the purpose and or intent of and for procreation. So if you are having sex for fun, it's illegal. It's only man on top of woman. Some of the older laws go into actual leg spreading and I mean, detailed to the point of almost pornographic, which is funny because it's so conservative in the Bible Belt and they're dictating exactly how people can have sex. And it's only if you want to have a child. How boring is that? How ridiculous is that? More more so than anything. I almost fell asleep just listening to it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Uh, I can't even, to be honest, I can't think of the last time I had sex in the missionary position. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to say that it doesn't happen. I'm just going to say that it doesn't happen is the only way that it happens. Yeah. Even in a, a single go round. I'll put it that way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the old old uh, uh, song. Uh, get went in the 90s 22 positions in a one night stand 
Yep. <laughs> so, you know, we obviously don't like these laws simply because they're mostly either way too generalized or too specific in some cases. And the idea of something being morally reprehensible, it doesn't sit well with us here at the crypt. And I'm sure it doesn't with you either, especially in terms of legality, because too often these laws, they're created and often immoral in their basis or they're based on religious practices where the Constitution of the United States is supposed to protect us from these types of biases by separation of church and state. And I know you personally are very passionate about that one. Oh, yes, I am. Nothing like an angry atheist, right? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, bless your heart. God loves you anyway. (laughs) That's all right. (laughs) All right. Uh, We are having our fun with this because it is a dry topic. To me, it's so ridiculous, and especially in this section of it. And and we are going to get, I fear, we are going to get somewhat serious as we move on through this. But some of this stuff is just so ridiculous that it's laughable. But keep in mind that these are laws that we're talking about here. So, all right. Now we get to one of my favorite parts. And (laughs) You know it. Definitions. So what are some of the definitions where things are often considered illegal? And again, these are going to vary state to state. So these are generalizations, but uh, fun size hit us with that. All right. So I put these in alphabetical order just to make my day a little bit easier writing these things down for us. We've got assault and aggravated assault. And these are defined as acts of non-consensual touching of a person by another person or implement i.e. if you are picking up a flogger and you're going, oh, I'm not actually touching the person to assault them. Yes, you are. And then (laughs) aggravated assault is actually a step up from that. And it's the same thing, but with use of a deadly weapon, i.e. knife play always counts as aggravated assault. Oh, heavens to Betsy. I did some of that last night right here in my good old state of Tennessee. And I missed it. That's the sad part. Oh, yeah. I've got to post pictures of that on FET, too. Turned out quite nice. I think you'll like it. <laughs> okay. Sure I will, darling. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on, uh, what about these? You're talking about knife play. So I'm assuming we're going to go to carrying there. Yep. We're going to go to carrying a weapon. Knife play, for instance. Uh, I don't think there's that many people that carry guns into a BDSM scene. I haven't encountered them even here in Montana where everyone and their grandma likes to pack, but it's definitely counted in there as well. Some states have very specific laws as to even the size of the knife you may have on your person. And in most states, the blade cannot be longer than three inches, which is true here too. And if you're into scalpel play, these definitions may determine whether your scalpel is deemed a knife or not and therefore a weapon. Most of the time, if a cop decides to bust in in the middle of a scene for a raid or something, if they see you holding a scalpel, they will require you to put that quote-unquote weapon down. Unless you're a doctor or a veterinarian, chances are it's going to be considered a weapon. The same thing, I keep a taser in a box right beside my TENS unit. Some people enjoy it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's that's a weapon. It's not a deadly weapon, though there have been cases of people with bad hearts that you've hit them with it. And, and next thing you know, you're having to explain some. Oh, you got a lot of explaining to do, Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've got a weapon a lot of people think is solely for self-defense, but I've seen it used in scenes. Pepper spray. Mm, mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you are vicious. Oh, you know it. (laughs) Next on our list is false imprisonment and kidnapping. These are crimes of restraining another person without their consent. Now, obviously, we're all about consent, but if you're engaged in a scene and the police come in again and they find your partner tied up or in a cage, they may choose to view it as your partner being harmed and therefore incapable of offering consent. And, Cauldron, I know you've got a story which is now very funny about a consensual kidnapping, but at the time, I'm pretty sure you were getting close to uh, <clears throat> soiling your pants <laughs> in this particular case. Do, do you want to share that with our listeners today? Uh, yeah, those those have been around the crypt for a while know this one, but just as a reminder to how wrong things can go 
if you're not really paying attention to what you're doing. My slave and I had set up a scene and we were actually filming it. And she was walking down the street just outside of her neighborhood down toward town. And I was to drive up beside her and offer her a ride, blah, blah, blah. Then things turn really creepy. She gets scared, runs. So... Of course, I jump out of the car, chase her. I've got zip ties and a cloth that she wanted me to use actual chloroform, to which I refused because I didn't consider that to be safe. And thank goodness I didn't, because a little old lady driving by witnessed what was going on when I had her. She was, you know, just dead weight, playing to be knocked out, zip tied, hands and feet together, carrying her and putting her in the trunk of the car. And we were about a mile and a half away. And And right as soon as we pulled into her driveway, which her basement was just an unfinished, dingy, nasty place that was set up into an awesome play space. And we didn't do much cleaning, so it really made it a nice place for this particular scene. Here comes, I don't know, eight cop cars, six, eight cop cars coming in, lights and sirens just blazing. And jump out, guns drawn. I hit the deck and um, I know what's going on immediately. That doesn't change the situation that I have a girl with her clothes ripped off of her pretty much, except for maybe one or two articles, zip tied in the trunk of my car, gagged. (laughs) (laughs) And they're not really wanting to take a minute to listen to what I have to say. Luckily, I have my keys in my hand when I hit the ground with all these guns pointed at me. I threw my keys to the, at basically at the officer's feet as I dropped down and they open the trunk. They get her out, cut her loose, ungag her. And of course, she's pretty freaking scared at this point, which they mistake for me. And I've got officers on top of me, cuffing me, guns at my head. Um, and finally she explains what we were doing. The officers, for some reason, did not find it funny that we were playing in public in such a way. Um, <laughs> it scared the life out of this poor little old lady, uh, who was sitting just down the street watching a stereotypical Southern lady, permed hair, all short and blue. <laughs> <laughs> and just in an absolute panic in her car. Uh, but yeah, they, they gave us a very stern warning that if anything like that ever happened again, that they would arrest us for disturbing the peace. And <laughs> uh, yeah, so, uh, and looking back at it, Yes, it's a hilarious story, but also when you're doing things like that in public, that really teeters the line there because going into to safe, sane, consensual and informed. Well, that poor little old lady, she wasn't informed and she didn't consent to be parting part of our play that she had to witness and then chose to get involved in as a my good citizen would, but still, um, it kind of really made me think, uh, <laughs> about how to do things a little bit differently. <laughs> uh, which actually brings us into our next definition of indecent exposure. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is an act of showing genitals or in some cases, even breasts and buttocks. If done in your own home and someone can see through an open window, or if you're an exhibitionist going about things in a public setting, cauldron, you may <clears throat> be charged with this crime. I have to say, I really hate this one because I'm not an exhibitionist at all. <laughs> and I, I, I know you're laughing at that because because we're having discussions about this off mic. But if someone is being a peeping Tom and looking into my apartment bedroom window and I happen to have only a towel on because I just got out of the shower and the you. towel comes off. Well, to me, it's them that's the guilty party and not me because I didn't consent to them looking at me like that. Yeah. Also, what are they doing scale on the side of a building? Mm -hmm. Honestly. But on a very serious note with that one, there have been a lot of people charged with 
a form of sexual assault to a minor mm-hmm. and are now registered sex offenders because they have left windows open or blinds or curtains open, run around their house naked, and a child has seen them and the parent has filed, you know, called the police and they've been charged with it. And it's just, it's not good to do. So, though I agree with you, if someone's peeping in on me, that's on them. And luckily, most states have some pretty firm peeping Tom laws, but it's ridiculous. Now, me as an exhibitionist, I just really have to choose where that takes place. Uh, <laughs> and, yes, well. and, and just how <laughs> how much risk is involved. And there's a lot of things that go into that. But since things happen the way they did with the former slave there, I make sure that I take caution not to include people who are uh, just innocent bystanders of my actions. Exactly. Uh, So we've been talking about the police a lot. Let's talk about impersonating an officer. Oh, big no-no. Yeah, big no-no. This occurs if you engage in role play using costumes of police or firefighters. But in order for this to actually be a crime, you must be wearing a costume that is a replica or closely resembles the uniforms used in your region. For example, in my region, they wear brown uniforms here for the police. So if you wanted to dress up as a cop for role play, you should probably go with blue, just to steer clear of that law. And funnily enough, I had a friend who was charged for using a policeman's uniform in a church Christmas play a couple of years ago. He had actually borrowed it from a friend at the sheriff's department with the friend knowing what the costume was for. It had the badge with the badge number and everything on it. He only wore it for the costume and he was still charged with the crime. Wow, I'm surprised an officer would loan out their badge. I know. That guy apparently got in so much trouble for it, which he deserved. Yeah, I would and, imagine and so. And I, I ended up feeling really bad for this guy because he... Now, you said he was charged. Was he convicted? He was not convicted. Okay. Because I know yeah. most of the time they won't charge for this if the intent is not to impersonate an officer for personal gain, meaning that you're not creeping out on somebody and pulling them over or trying to mimic the actions of an officer to find out information or assault someone, just criminal intent. Yeah. But I could certainly see if, if I walked in somewhere in the little town that I live in, every cop knows every other cop. Without a doubt. And if I walked in wearing somebody else's uniform, obviously I'm not an officer. And thankfully, I haven't had many run ins or any run ins with any of the local authorities. So they're going to wonder who I stole the uniform from and take action against that if it's an actual police uniform. So I can kind of understand that. But in some ways, it can be ridiculous. And that's one of those laws that was set up to protect civilians Mm -hmm. from, you know, and throughout the years, there seems to be how everything comes in waves where you'll have somebody make national news because they're going around impersonating officers and pulling people over and then doing vile things to them from simply stealing their car to rape or murder. So I definitely see the need for it. But sometimes things, as with anything, people can go overboard pretty quickly, depending on what the climate is with a social status. Anyway, uh, my own personal soapbox there. Uh, The next one, uh, something that, (laughs) and this is going to sound bad at first, something that I have a lot of uh, personal experience with. So go ahead and out me. (laughs) Okay. I just want to point out that you consented to that. Yes, Uh, ma'am. Prostitution is unfortunately a misdemeanor charge that professional dominants may have to face at some point. It seems that the best way to minimize your risk with this is simply to offer non-sexual services, but depending on which state you are in, the definitions of this could be horrifically tight to extremely loose. With this one, there has been a major change in the past year or two where they used to let Johns and Janes go or charge them with a misdemeanor. They can now be charged with felony, aiding, and abetting of sex trafficking. Yes. That is a tense one, right? Yeah, and 
working in the industry that I now work in, it is not uncommon to meet a lady of the night. And that is one of the big pushes. And people don't understand this when it comes to prostitution. The main reason why they arrest the prostitutes is not because of the legality of the prostitution, but for their own safety. It's so that they can get them back to the police station and talk to them and find out, are they trafficked or have they been trafficked into the sex industry? Or is this something that they choose to do? Are they working alone or do they have a pimp? Are they being abused by this pimp? And a lot of people don't understand that there are a lot of prostitutes that do it because they enjoy it. They want to do it. It is a kink. Now, that is not something that I would in any way consider safe or sane. But nonetheless, that is how it is. And I know some of these people, and that's why I say that. But as far as the BDSM world goes and prostitution with being a professional dominant, even if you're not having sex with your clients and it's strictly impact play or degradation, humiliation, whatever. And there's absolutely no disrobing, full disrobing genitalia are covered at all times. If somebody comes in, it's what does it look like in the moment? And the police have the ability to make that determination for themselves. So if they think it's an apple, well, then it's an apple. Even though it might be a guitar, to them it looks like an apple. So they're going to arrest you under the grounds, their own personal findings of it being an apple. And then you will have to prove, no, that was not an apple at all. I know how it looked, but that was actually a guitar. It's something that I have had to face in the past one time, and thankfully it was easily explained. The officers were understanding and it was in a large city. It was in Atlanta. So things were a lot looser back then and even more so now. So it was easily taken care of. But Yes, it is something that most professional dominants at some point will have to face uh, within the United States if they have a very large client base. Next one, nothing to joke about here, rape and molestation. What are the legal definitions there? They are defined as forced and or non-consensual intercourse or contact, which includes any penetration, however slight, of the vagina or anus with any object, touching of one person's genitals to the anus or mouth of another, or touching of the sexual intimate parts of another for sexual gratification. Wow, that is certainly a mouthful, but um, and no pun intended there. No. But it should be obvious to any person that listens to this what rape or molestation is defined as, but legally, that's something that we have to include. Now, there is consensual non-consent that we have to look at. We may get into that later, but I think that's that edge play that we're going to hit in season two and getting into that a lot deeper as to what that is. Man, that episode's been a long time coming. Yes, it has. If you don't have the common sense or understanding to know what rape or molestation is, then... um, I'm not so certain that this podcast can really help you much. All right. So do you have anything to add to that? No, I think we have that one covered really well. All right. One of my favorite things, as you know, is CNC. And part of that is uh, going past the safe, sane, consensual, and informed into rack play, risk-aware, consensual kink, to where you consent to doing something, but you're acting as though you don't, or it's a little bit harsher play than what you would normally consent to, but that is what you want. So it is something that is greatly discussed, talked about, lined out, planned in detail, but we're talking about these definitions and these legal terms And I throw that out there because this is something that is certainly going to be misconstrued by law enforcement as reckless endangerment. And this is a crime consisting of acts that create a substantial risk of serious physical injury to another person. The accused person isn't required to intend the resulting or potential harm. So you can harm somebody accidentally and still be charged with reckless endangerment, but they must have acted in a way that showed a disregard for the foreseeable consequences of these actions. Now, as I was talking about with edge play, this would essentially include any act of edge play, including fun size. What is one of your most favorite things? Rope bondage and suspension. Mm Mm-hmm. 
easily falling into the area here of reckless endangerment, does it not? Yes, it does. And how does that make you feel personally? Just fine. <laughs> um, I'm not too too concerned with breaking that particular law, so long as the person that I am doing the scene with, or as long as I am not seriously harmed, or there is a death that results. And I think most of us out there in the lifestyle have to acknowledge that for ourselves, that we do in our own way break a lot of these laws sometimes, but we also have our own boundaries. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And as long as those boundaries are maintained and with each person, it's going to be different. It's going to be personal, whether it's because of pain tolerances or personal experience or abuse or stories that they've heard that scares them off or makes them fall in love with an action, even though they haven't tried it yet, which gets into frenzy. Um, Yeah, it's certainly something that we have to make up our own. And in the show notes for all of these terms, you do have a link included, right? Or one for reckless endangerment specifically? One for reckless endangerment specifically for its legal definition. And I do have other citations in the show notes as usual of areas that I researched and things that people should really just read over themselves if they get a chance to as well. Excellent. And for a direct link there, that's cauldronscript.com slash 137. All right. The last one, and this one, there's a part of it that I really disagree with, and that is sodomy, which is sex that involves either anal genital contact or oral genital contact or oral anal contact. Most places still consider this as simply anal sex. The part in there that I disagree with in the definition is the oral genital contact, because it is my understanding that, that as we said, simply anal sex, sodomy is, is anal sex. That's what everybody knows it as. Mm-hmm. So for that to be part of the definition, it seems kind of like an earmark uh, <laughs> when they're writing laws, just something that they wanted to throw in there a little bit extra just to get a little push to make, oh, by the way, we can also charge somebody with this if we really want to. Uh, most likely. Yeah. And what people don't understand, because they're hearing this, and they're like, well, what happens in your bedroom is your business. Yes, except for the fact that there are still several cases every year in the United States where these particular laws are put into effect for some reason. Somebody just decides that they want to jump on a bandwagon and prove a point or make an example out of somebody. And to be honest, most of the time you can track it down to a vendetta being fulfilled when these arrests are being made. It very much disgusts me because it's a Gestapo type of treatment. But yeah, that's that's something in I know every state in the South, anal is illegal because it's not missionary with the intent to procreate. Ooh, if they knew what was going to go on in my bedroom once I moved down there, they'd arrest me every day. (laughs) (laughs) You dirty, dirty little girl. (laughs) You know it. All right. So moving away from definitions, and this is a comical point to me in some cases with the first point here. But legal forms that can help you with your alternative lifestyle. I think bullet point number one, we're both chomping at the bit to point out we, Fun Size and I, need to address this right off the bat. As a disclaimer, I say every episode that BDSMcontracts.org, they support us. They give us those contracts to give away. I absolutely love them. It was put together by somebody in the legal field. So they're very professionally done. They cover nearly every topic you can, but they themselves tell you flat out on their website that it is not a legally binding contract. And one of the big reasons for that is because most of the things that you are consenting to under that contract you don't have a right to consent to in the United States. In other countries, it's different, obviously. Some you do, some you don't. Now, what we're chomping at the bit to get to the point of here is Fifty Shades of Grey. Now, they brought just a metric ton of nonsense and confusion for many, many 
newbies thinking that, that these BDSM contracts were legally binding and simply they're not. They're a tool to outline and help a relationship, nothing more. And every so often, because of this show, I will force myself to watch that abomination. <laughs> I'm going to be forced to watch its sequel, <laughs> yeah. the second one, with a friend here very soon, and uh, I'm not looking forward to it. I'm mm. I'm probably going to be biting pretty hard into a pillow just to keep from yelling at the screen. Yeah, so, uh, and the, with the third one coming out. And then the fourth one already having a trailer? Yeah, <laughs> so anyway... As I go back and watch these, one thing that I did notice in the movie, now I don't know about the book. I've admitted many times I've never read the book. but It's the, in the book. Okay. The only part of the contract that is legally binding in Fifty Shades where they're sitting at the dining room table having a very BS-based negotiation scene, he brings up the non-disclosure agreement that she has to sign. And he says, I need this for my attorneys. Now, that is correct. That is a legally binding document. You can sign it between two people, a people in a business or two businesses. Most companies that I've gone to work for, I have had to sign these type of uh, non-disclosure agreements. Uh, however, this isn't even legal when it comes to protecting someone from an illegal acts. So if my company is performing illegal acts and I become a whistleblower, then that non-disclosure becomes void. So they can't turn around and sue me because I outed them for doing something unethical and illegal. But as far as the actual contract with the toys and types of play and this stuff, that has no legal application whatsoever. It is great for helping the conversation. That's why, that's the main point of why I personally do contracts, because it forces you to talk about some of the stuff that you either might not want to, or you forget about, and it just helps to make sure that you are turning over and uncovering everything that really should be. Fun Size, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think that's really covered very well there, despite wanting to jump in. (laughs) <laughs> and steal that one from you. I will, however, jump into the next one, which is POA forms, aka power of attorney. They come in a diff- couple different kinds, depending on whether or not you're going to have medical control. But it's a form which allows the person acting as guardian or attorney. You don't actually have to be an attorney. You just get called the attorney in the terms of these forms. It allows them to assume control and responsibility for someone else. And these can range from private affairs to business and medical, depending on the terms specified in the form. And it's important not only to file these forms, but to also have them notarized for legal purposes. And that just really helps them stand up. And power of attorney is something that has to go through the court system, Mm -hmm. whether it is turned over. I know with the military, most married military men and women, if they are called to war or even in some cases, regardless whether they're at war or not, they make their spouse their power of attorney. That way they can handle all of their business affairs and be completely responsible for any medical decisions. If something tragic were to happen, working in the psych field, we had guardian ad litems, which were court appointed. The guardian ad litem actually has a little bit different job. They try to take a non-biased look at the situation and see. And usually these are attorneys. So they know the law, they get to know the patient, and they will advise the court on what to do if the patient is not mentally or physically able to make their own decisions. So it's something that is often you see it in movies as well. People tricking their parents into uh, signing over their rights. And when that happens, that's what it is, is they're signing to allow their children or their caretaker or whoever to have control over whatever area or all areas and make all decisions for them. So it's something that is both incredibly important, but also something that unfortunately is tragically abused in a lot of cases. In the state of Montana, and I know this because for several years I held power of attorney for my father, on the state of Montana specific forms, it says that unless a date is specified to end the terms, they can last for a certain amount of years before needing to be renewed. But the person that you are representing can 
cancel your powers at any time in writing. It just has to be submitted to the court. Mm -hmm. So there's no tricking someone out of their control. If they are mentally conscious enough to submit a written form saying that you are no longer power of attorney, then you can't trick or control them. I really want to throw that in for anyone that is thinking of abusing this in any way. And I think there's probably a lot of states that have systems like that to help protect the person Mm -hmm. that you're trying to represent. Yeah, it, well, and that that also goes case by case as well, though, because if it's psychiatric, something of that nature, then there's going to be a hearing. The judge will make the determination on whether or not they get their rights back or the power of attorney is still a necessity. And then they'll also evaluate the power of attorney at that time and see if they're abusing the power or if they do need to, in fact, continue and that it is justified. There's muddy waters like crazy with that particular thing. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of abuse, but it is a very necessary thing in a lot of cases. So yeah. let's go ahead and hit the the next one here. Something that I'm very passionate about that I just heard a story about that I will share, but this is on wills. So what do you have on a will? Wills exist so that we have protection when the unexpected happens. And this is as true in the vanilla world as it is in our alternative lifestyle. This is especially important if you have a long-term relationship or live with your MS or DS partner. And it's also recommended that you have a reading of the will before anything happens to you. It will save your loved ones a lot of hassle, especially if there's a chance things are considered unfair. Uh, What do you have to add? So I listened to Dave Ramsey. He's the third largest uh, radio show in the world. He's a big financial guru, and most people know him for his baby steps. And he had a caller call into the show, and her mother had passed and left her the house. Well, she is tied up in knots. She has a brother and a sister wanting their $15,000 apiece because her mother left her the house and told her right before she died that if she ever sells the house to give them $15,000 a piece and that's it. Not a third of it. That's it. That's what they get. It wasn't in a will. There wasn't a reading of the will before or after the house was signed over to her prior to the death. But her question was, should she take out a loan? Should she file a lien against the house to get her brother and sister their $15,000? thousand because they were raising all kinds of heck wanting that money. And the answer to that is simply no. The mother's last wishes were if she ever sells it. And come to find out, the brother and sister didn't have anything to do with the mother for two and a half years prior to her death. Nothing whatsoever. But all of a sudden she's dead and they want their 15 grand a piece. And working in nursing homes, I saw this a lot. And even when there is a will, of course, it can be contested. But if you make out a will and you have the reading of the will beforehand, if her mother would have done that, it would have saved her a whole lot of issue with the brother and sister because it would have come straight from mama. Mm -hmm. And, oh, well, thanks. I'm glad you're wanting to argue with me in the last two weeks that I'm going to be alive. But no, you're not getting anything because you have completely turned your back on me and had nothing to do with me. And now all you the only reason you're here is to see how much you're going to get when I'm gone. So it's a really, really big issue that I've seen working in it. And I unfortunately have been around a lot of uh, people who have passed. I've sat with a lot of people while they've passed and the families, that's just the most ridiculously inhumane time for a lot of people to let their worst shine through. People get crazy over money or property, whether it's a watch or 40 acres, doesn't matter. So if you can go ahead and get ahead of that, you're going to save your family a whole lot of issue afterwards. Sure, you may have to put up with a little bit of hassle because, well, they didn't get this and they didn't want they didn't get that. And there may be some conversation and things may be changed and you might have to do it again. But I have a 
will and everybody in my family knows already. I've sent them copies of it. Everybody knows what is to be done, what my final wishes are. And I've changed it over the past 10, 15 years, three times. And it's not that expensive to do. In fact, you can do it online for really cheap. You just have to make sure that it's filed correctly. Anyway, that's another important thing that's not so much BDSM related, except for where you're talking about living with your in an MS or DS partnership, especially then if you're not legally married, you get into a whole lot of other issues. So just can't stress it enough how important this is. If you haven't done it, do it now. Go to LegalZoom. We don't get anything for that endorsement, but that's the fastest, easiest way that I can think of to do it. All right. Moving on into protective orders, which is different from restraining orders. Now, these are to keep a person away from you if you feel there's a reason to fear for immediate harm or danger. These are typically only obtained in the case of actual physical harm or sexual assault. Pretty cut and dry there. Anything to add? Nope. All right. All right. I'm going to do the restraining orders portion because I have one. Restraining orders are legal orders which requires the person it has been filed against to stay a set distance away from the person who has filed the order and can ban all forms of contact. This is especially important if you're ever confronted with a stalker, which I know both you and I have been in the past, unfortunately. And I have one right now. Mm-hmm. Two. That's, that's no good. I'm going to throw this out there. Leave Master Cauldron alone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's it's not okay. It's not okay to ever stalk or harass someone. Unfortunately, it can be often difficult to get a restraining order approved for threats or stalking. Mine was approved because of past physical harm, but it's often difficult because you have to present evidence that you are being stalked or harassed. In the case of my stalker, would literally stand outside my bedroom window in an old house that I lived at. And at the time I was seeking the order, thankfully it was middle of winter and there was snow all all over the ground showing footprints and I was able to take pictures of those footprints, call the police, have them come out and have them test the actual footprint against that person's shoes to prove that they were standing outside of my bedroom window while I was trying to sleep with the curtains drawn. Well, look at you going all CSI. Oh, it was it was so creepy. I'm not going to lie. I had trouble sleeping after that for quite a while. Nope, then next I, on CSI I still- Montana. <laughs> Yeah, I I actually still have nightmares about people watching me sleep due to this person's action. And things like phone logs and calls, text messages. I know it's very tempting when you get a text message or an email from someone that's harassing or stalking you to delete it so that you don't have to deal with it again. But it is important to save these things if you're planning to seek a restraining order because they can be used as evidence in some cases. Yeah. With mine, I've had one for several years that come out of the psych hospital. (laughs) It's scary enough. Um, Luckily, I'm not too much concerned with her. It's been fairly harmless just a a few times of showing up at my job, contacting me randomly and at very inappropriate hours and showing up in places that I was shopping randomly, which certainly led me to believe that it wasn't just a coincidence, especially when it wasn't even in the town that we live in. It was a town over. But I never went through the process of filing because I didn't feel that it was more than an inconvenience. I wasn't at risk of harm, I don't believe. And if ever that changed, I certainly would file. Still to this day, if it changes, I will. And the other person doesn't live around me. So it's all done online. And that's even more difficult when you're dealing with other states or countries and online harassment and It's not bullying, and that's where a lot of the online laws have gone to because of all the teen online bullying and the trolling and things of that nature, which is good. I'm very proud of that, but yeah, so at this point, there's nothing really that I can do. I've put out all the digital blocking that I can put out and just hoping that they will finally decide to disappear on their own in a nonviolent way (laughs) because I don't want that either. But yes, in, in your case, certainly a risk of harm all three emotionally physically and uh, mentally so yeah 
All right, now we get into what to do. And this is a very fun part for me. This is something that I do know a lot more about than I wish I did because of a bad situation that I faced as a teenager where I was not at fault and it was proven that I was not at fault and they finally admitted that I wasn't. But I knew what to do because of a TV show. And that's the only thing that I went by was what I saw on a TV show and come to find out years later in talking to one of my best friends that that I mentioned earlier that's an attorney, I did exactly the right thing. And they will do everything to make you change this. But what you do when you're faced with the police, fun size, get us started. No matter the situation, first off, stay calm, but appropriate. And, okay. and we, stay calm, but appropriate. A lot of people will put their focus on remaining calm. And in, in some situations, this is something that can make you be guilty. But the most important thing or that can make you look guilty. But the most important thing is the two together, calm, but appropriate. You know, you have to be able to answer questions. Really, when we stay calm, we are talking about not becoming angry at them. So more hysterical. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, which which can be very difficult to do in some situations and some seemingly impossible. So, all right, next. Next, you're going to call an attorney immediately to assist you. Law is very tricky. We're not experts, so call an expert. Even if you are an attorney, call another attorney to your side because your best representation is not always yourself. Yeah, that's funny that you say that because that's exactly what my friend said when we were talking about a specific case that made news. And he's he's talking about even as an attorney, if I get into trouble, the first thing that I'm going to do is call my attorney. I'm not going to represent myself. That works virtually none. So, of course, he was <laughs> overdoing it a little bit with that. There are a few cases here and there. But, yeah, for the most part, you just immediately call an attorney. Your first call, if something happens, 911. Your second call, make that an attorney. If something was to happen in a scene or something like that with me, my wife is going to be way down on the list of people that I call, to be perfectly honest. And it's not because she's not the most important person in my life, but it's because if I want to make sure that I'm going to be around with her, I'm going to take care of putting on my mask first before I help my neighbor with their mask type of thing. All right. So the next one, and I want to hit this one because this is okay. what saved me in this situation, even though the person eventually come out and said this was not true. Basically, oops, I filed a false police report for multiple reasons. Be careful not to self-incriminate. Lawyer up immediately. Unfortunately, some detectives, they just want to get the case closed and have a conviction on their record. They wanted to make this case and get it to the district attorney so that charges can be filed and they can get it to court and boom, they've got that collar. They don't care if you're actually guilty or not. Always use your right to remain silent, even if you haven't been charged and they're just talking to you or just asking you a few questions. Don't answer anything without an attorney because there's so many cases. In fact, most of the cases that you see on TV where it's come out years later that they were not guilty, if it was not a DNA thing, what usually led to it was that they went ahead and started answering questions and then everything got twisted up. And I can't fault the police for it. When something tragic happens, they want to make some Somebody pay for what they've done. But sometimes, and I'm, I know it sounds like I'm generalizing every detective, every cop out there, and I'm not. In my opinion, most police officers, most detectives have the best of intentions and they do things the correct way. But unfortunately, there are some, like I said, they just want to get their collar on their record. Hey, I've made this arrest and this arrest led to a conviction. So they're wanting their next promotion or whatever the case may be. And uh, you got to protect yourself from that so is certainly you're right and if they try to threaten you with well if you're not going to answer my questions now then we're going to have to go down to the police station and answer them there okay then i'll just call my attorney back and have my attorney meet us over there at the police station instead of coming here to my house or whatever not a problem and that goes into remaining calm it's not an argument no i'm waiting for my attorney to get here it's plain and simple attorney 
One word, attorney. (laughs) But stand your ground on it. There's nothing that they can do about it. You have that right in this country. As an American, you have that right. So use it. And that's not just after you've been read your Miranda rights where you have the right to remain silent and everything can and will be used against you in a court of law. If you cannot afford an attorney, blah, blah, blah. But you don't have to wait for them to implement your Miranda rights. You have that prior to them saying that as well. And a lot of people don't realize that. I know to some people, uh, some of you listening, you're like, come on, move to the next thing. But not everybody understands that. Um, Not everybody has had brushes with the law or has a best friend that is a lawyer or whatever. So they just know what they see on TV. In some cases, that's good. In others, not so much. All right, moving on into something that we just talked about in the previous couple of episodes, consent. So what if a consent violation has occurred and you need to seek legal assistance? Call the police and follow the first three steps. And then what, fun size? Next, you're not going to wash or remove any evidence on your person or clothing. Tempering with evidence in and of itself is a crime, not to mention the fact that it immediately makes you look guilty of something that may not be a chargeable offense, but now they'll make it one. This is also very important to mention that if it is a case of sexual assault, the more evidence, the better. So I know you want to clean up, you want to get it off of you as fast as possible, but you are not doing yourself any favors. You really just have to grit your teeth and let them collect the evidence. The first step in this, which we're following what you've lined out here. And uh, I think the first step there needs to be battle the shame within. Mm-hmm. Because more than likely, that's going to be the first instinct is feeling shame over what just took place. And that's going to immediately lead to, oh, I got to take the hot shower and scrub down. It's Nothing that you have done, you don't need to be ashamed of it, and it's not your secret to keep. If they want to keep a secret, that's on them, but it's not your secret to keep. Tell about it. Throw it out there. Call the police. Follow these steps that we're laying out here today. But there's nothing shameful about it. There really isn't. And once you become comfortable with saying it, with getting it out there, that also helps in the healing process. It's the only way to heal from it, truly. And with that said, I'll share. When I was eight years old, I was molested. I have no shame in that. It wasn't something that, that I'd done. Now, if I was the one that did that violation to an eight-year-old, that would be different. Then I should feel shame, but I don't. It wasn't me that did it. So I have no problem telling anybody about it. And it took a lot of years to get to that point. And when I did, it was one of those things that I now look back and think, how freaking ridiculous and stupid was I to think that I should have been the one ashamed and that I should have kept that secret. So just offering a little moral support there to anybody that this has happened to, or unfortunately, anybody that this does end up happening to. So make that your first step. Don't allow yourself to feel shame of something that was not your action. It's not your shame. So, all right. Uh, And in that, like Fun Size pointed out, being careful not to wash or remove any evidence from yourself, your clothes, your surroundings, anything. What's the next step after that? Seek medical attention if needed. Most hospitals will actually call the police and the social worker when there are signs of abuse. As I've shared before, this is what happened to me. In this case, it does help to be completely honest unless you want your partner to go to jail or if your partner does need to go to jail. Yes. And uh, (laughs) either way, and I know this is under the consent violation when it has occurred, but if something happens, and I'm just going to throw that out out there real quick if something happens and you end up having to go to the hospital and they're pushing you oh my god you're so abused you have these bruises and stuff and something that has happened from consensual play be very honest about it and a lot of times i mean nurses in ers and doctors they're not dumb i've worked with them they know and chances are to be perfectly honest they're all kinky too for the Mm -hmm. most part some of the nurses that i've worked with are some of the kinkiest people that I've ever known in my life. I freaking love them. 
<laughs> <laughs> but and and to fall under this with a consent violation, there again, don't feel that shame. Be completely honest and work with the system. Tell them the information that they need to know to make sure that the abuser is brought to justice. And there again, fun size. I know in several episodes, seems like here recently we've been hitting on your personal abuse. For that, I apologize and I thank you for being willing and able to share that. But I have to ask you, I know the situation. So I know that there was physical harm there, great physical harm. And I'm assuming that as soon as it was possible, you went to an ER or a physician? Yes. I actually didn't get to follow our steps down to the letter. I had to get away from my attacker first. Mm -hmm. And um, I had to stay calm while driving myself, bleeding very badly to the hospital. They immediately hooked me up to IVs and gave me morphine and had me on my stomach cutting my clothes off that I had managed to throw on because the lashes from the whip on my back were so bad that one of them, just one, required 27 stitches to close. And I was pretty out of it for hours. And when I woke up, it was honestly with a cop and a social worker right there ready to talk to me. While I was out, they had done a rape kit on me just to try to collect evidence, which thankfully for me was not there because my attacker was a woman. And that's not to say that women cannot be sexually assaulted by other women. I'm simply pointing out that the physical evidence of that is harder to collect. And thankfully, that was not part of the assault on my person. Yeah. So you get yourself there. You're passed out mm -hmm. and you wake up. Uh, how willing were you at that point to discuss what had taken place? Because with being in the BDSM community, and this was a member of the community, or hopefully mm -hmm. a previous member of the community that performed this act of violence against you, uh, was it, were you so rattled and in so much pain that you were just eager or was there still some sense of reservation and, and or shame that kind of prevented you from wanting to get into what happened or uh, how'd that go for you? There was definitely reservation there. There was shame. There was fear of outing another in my community and outing myself. And more than that, I honestly did have the resounding question in my head over and over again before I could even get a word out while I was trying to process everything that had happened of do I really want to say anything at all? Is this going to happen to another person? I kept asking myself if it was going to happen to another person if I didn't say anything. And I came to the determination that it most likely would, which is what pushed me on to reporting the crime for what it was. Yeah. Uh, and I think that is one of the most common things that somebody's going to ask themselves. And the other one uh, is... And I, again, thank you for diving into this and sharing this with me and everyone else. I know our cryptors certainly appreciate you for this as well. But did you have a, a thought of, did I actually consent to this? If I say that I did not, is that actually true? Was there a moment that I consented and I didn't realize it? Maybe, maybe I did and... Uh, you know, was there any of that confusion or thought process going on? Or was this such a clear cut case that there was no question whatsoever? I had consented to whipping to the point of welting, not to the point of breaking skin, not to the point of needing stitches and being having so much blood. Yeah. I had to have my car reupholstered to get rid of the bloodstains that soaked through my driver's seat at that time. So it was just an absolute clear-cut case. Um, so that was not a question it, with you. It was, actually. Oh, even in um, this case. At the time. Okay. It was at the time of I consented to being hurt. I consented to being whipped. It is on me that this person went too far. There, there was definitely that moment. And I want to say for anyone that has been abused, anyone that's had their consent taken beyond the boundaries that they have set, that it is never your fault if a person does not respect those boundaries or goes too far. It is on them. And I think that's a hard question for me to ask you, but it certainly goes to show that even in such a clear-cut case of a consent violation, the natural reaction 
is to question yourself and your own actions and your own consent. And a lot of times that's one of the things that brings shame to the game, unfortunately. And now that I wasn't meaning to rhyme that or make a pun, this is something that we obviously take very serious. But you're going to go through these steps and hearing about it beforehand. If this does unfortunately happen to you, then hopefully this episode and previous episodes will come back to what Fun Size has had to say about our own experience and uh, mine with my very limited experience of this. But thank you so much. I know we're going to try to keep the commentary a little light on this because it was a long episode, but as we record these shows, it grows on its own. So again, just thank you so much. All right, so moving on, whether you're seeking to press charges or file a civil suit or both, you'll need to know a few things about these and mainly the differences. So if you care to, uh, fun size, what is the differences? What first, let's start with criminal charges. What is that? Criminal charges. Well, the first thing you need to know is that prosecutors press criminal charges, not individuals. After the police have been notified of a possible crime, they will often ask the victim if they would like to press charges, and this may influence the proceedings. Prosecutors may press charges if an arrest has been made regardless of whether the victim has said yes or no, because prosecutors act on the behalf of society and not a singular individual. They look at the evidence given, including victim statements, and may choose to proceed with a criminal case or not. Meantime, the person who has the charges pressed against them may be held at a length determined by the crime, risk involved, and many other factors. It's very important when I talk about my past experiences and saying that criminal charges were brought. I did not sit there and press charges. I did not file up forms for that. I gave a statement and presented what evidence was on my person, but it was really the choice of the prosecutor here in the state of Montana. Yeah. Now, civil suits is a whole lot different. I know with what I referred to earlier when I was a teenager, I had the opportunity to file a civil suit because there were so many things involved, defamation of character. In fact, the police actually encouraged me to do it, but I just wanted it done and over with. They gave me the information that I needed to know, which was, you know what? You're clear and free. (laughs) It's very obvious. You didn't do this. She's admitted that you didn't do this. So with that civil suit, and I know you have a really good explanation of this, so I would prefer if you go ahead and hit that. These are lawsuits filed between an individual or group and another individual or group. Usually in the case of BDSM, these will be damages to one's person or property, etc., and should be handled with the assistance of an attorney. Medical bills incurred and therapy can be covered in these suits. As I said, the reupholstering of my car and my medical bills were actually part of a civil suit against my attacker. And, you know, thinking about these two and the differences, and since his death, people my age, a little younger, older, will bring up certain things about Michael Jackson and his past. Mm -hmm. And it's now, since he's dead, it's almost considered taboo. Well, you can't say that. But when he was charged with molestation or under investigation for it, Mm -hmm. and as best as I can remember, and I may be wrong about this, but as best as I can remember, he was not convicted of any wrongdoing, but there was a civil suit to which they finally settled out of court for a non-disclosed amount of money. So that's, you know, you're looking at the criminal charges, even though they were not maintained Contained by the courts or upheld by the courts, the criminal charges were not upheld and and the case was dissolved. The civil suit was maintained and found to be at fault there. So different things for different reasons and with different people acting on these, the courts versus the individual or the group or company, whatever the case may be. Do you have anything else to add there? For me, because I actually had to be in the same courtroom as my attacker for the civil suit, it was much more difficult for me than a criminal case because I did not have the prosecutor there really taking charge and being a bull for it. I had an attorney for my civil case, but it was just a lot more difficult for me to ask for that kind of justice. 
face to face. Yeah, I would imagine that would get into a tricky situation. Now, did you have the order of protection or was this person in jail at the time of the filing of the civil suit or they were in jail? For the civil suit filing, they were allowed to come to the court for that while still in jail. They had a guard with them, of course, as part of their escort. But it it just it was very difficult because honestly, they they kept staring at me, and I didn't have a protective order because I did not feel that I was in immediate danger. I already had my restraining order in place to keep them from calling or writing to me from jail. Okay. I I couldn't imagine. Yeah. I throw that out there for anyone that has to experience this. It can be more difficult. That's a very good point to make. Okay. So moving on into consent is a defense. Now, that sounds really weird, even saying it. Consent is a defense. But you've got the ALI, American Law Institute Project, with the NCSF. And most newer people don't know what the NCSF is, but that stands for the National Coalition for Sexual Freedom. They've been in and out of the news recently for their steps in not only our community, but American law as a whole in regards to the LGBT community and major progressions that we are trying to make within this country and make things truly fair and truly ethical. So what are they doing? What is it? What's going on with them? Uh, What you got? They are a group of lawyers working to change the model penal code, which is the structure that most states build their legal systems from. And their primary goal with working with this ally project right now is to decriminalize consensual BDSM. They don't want it to be a criminal act for us to consent to things that we want to do as adults anymore, which is a wonderful thing that gives me a lot of hope for this country and honestly for the world around me. Mm-hmm. So they're, trying, and- they're basically trying to bring it to my body, my choice. Exactly. Which is the way that it should be. If I want you to flog me with barbed wire, then I should be allowed to have you flog me with barbed wire. (laughs) Oh, Cauldron, I didn't know that you realized that was one of my kinks. (laughs) Uh, You're right. I didn't realize (laughs) <laughs> all right so uh i i will i will not take you using that example as consent however we we will have to negotiate this at a later time uh, no uh, I'm, I'm just i'm just going to go ahead and stop that negotiation now because as you know <laughs> i don't get flogged uh so what are we what are we talking here as far as primary focus i mean i, I know we've made it pretty simple there, but you got a little bit more for me? Well, the primary focus of their work at present is working to currently change non-consensual BDSM from being a matter of criminal assault to one of sexual assault, because BDSM is not an attack on one person against another, which is the premise of criminal assault law. Rather, BDSM is intended to be a mutually pleasurable interaction between two people in which any pain or stimulation that is consented to is welcomed by that person and is experienced as a form of pleasure. And that was pulled right from their article, and I've got a citation right there in our show notes for it. And for that, cauldronscript.com slash 137. While you're there, go ahead and sign up for the newsletter and the show notes will come to you automatically. And with that little aside out of the way, so with the laws as they stand, you know, they're working to change them, but what is it now or how are they trying to change it? What's going on there? As it is now, if you are the victim of a crime in a BDSM scene, you're going to be faced with a few questions and choices as to how to best pursue justice. If any sexual act was involved, the crime will be labeled as sexual assault. Victims of sexual assault fall under what is commonly known as a rape shield, which protects their identity from the press along with any previous acts they have engaged in. For example, if you're been part of the BDSM scene for years and you've had the cops talk to you or had any charges pressed against you, that's not going to come up if you are suddenly the victim of a sexual assault. And it's not going to make it look like, and I, I hate to say this because I hate the way it sounds, but we all have heard these stories. It's not going to sound like it was your fault. And I definitely want to throw the disclaimer out there. It is never the victim's fault. I don't care what was going on. 
it is never the victim's fault. Yeah. So, so that is if there is sexual in quotes there sexual activity. So, yes. so what they're trying to do, if I'm if I'm understanding you correctly on this, is change that to include the rape shield if there was. Mm-hmm. Okay. If there was BDSM involved. And this will actually allow us to protect ourselves from being publicly outed if we have to report a crime. Okay. So currently, if there was no sexual act involved, the crime is going to be labeled just simply uh, as assault. Or uh, aggravated assault. Or yes. aggravated assault. Okay. So the public ramifications of that would mean that anybody could search it and find that you were the victim of this assault instead of being covered. And I assume that's why they're trying to include this is to allow the practitioners of BDSM to not be outed publicly. I think that's part of it. And I think because they are so ethically minded, I feel like part of the reason why they're including it is their definition that BDSM is, in essence, a practice which offers sexual stimulation, if not sexual activity for its users. And in that sense, they're trying to almost change the definition of sexual assault to any assault which occurs non-consensually, which involves any form of sexual stimulation. Um, So it's going to be a very tricky thing, I think, for them to change, but they definitely have a good group to work with, and I personally like the work they're doing. Yeah, and some people want to understand that. They're like, well, if it wasn't sex, if there wasn't penetration in one of the orifices, then it didn't count. But a week ago or two weeks ago, playing, I guess it was two weeks ago, playing at the dungeon, I played with four women that night. And three of the four during the scene with no genital contact whatsoever, simply from using basic toys, floggers, whips, canes, barehanded spanking, orgasmed multiple times from the impact play. So I can certainly understand from experience the sexual nature of it and just the protective side of it. Because if that changes, then that would have offered you a lot of protection and and a lot of other people protection given the circumstances. So it's something that we really need to support. If you're not familiar with the NCSF, again, that's the National Coalition for Sexual Freedom. As Fun Size said, she's posted a link in the show notes. Check them out. It's something that we really need to get behind. We really need to support them. Now, is it an organization that I agree with everything? I've not found an organization that I agree with everything that they do period. But absolutely the majority of what they stand for, I'm behind and I do endorse them 100%. It's about the only organization out there that is trying to really make positive strides for sexual freedom. But check it out. Make up your own mind. Support them. Hopefully I'll f- you'll find that it's something you can get behind and you'll offer your support. But any final thoughts on that organization or the ALI project or anything? No, I think we're really good on this particular subject. Okay. Well, what about overall as a conclusion? What kind of final statement would you like to make on that? As far as that goes, when dealing with a law, there's a lot of pros and cons, things which are going to offer us protection, but also a mess we can find ourselves in all too easily. So the best things we can do really at the end of the day, before, after, in between any scene, any part of our lifestyle is properly vet, negotiate, ensure consent and communicate with anyone that we are going to have any kind of contact with. And if we do this and we come to face to face with the police, it's just best to stay calm and seek assistance. Yeah. Couldn't have said it better myself. So, I mean, that's really it as far as DDSM and the law goes. Yeah. And again, I guess not really a conclusion, but a reminder of the disclaimer, myself nor fun size are attorneys. This was put together based on research and personal experience, as was everything said in this particular episode and, and every episode. So if you have any real questions about this, I mean, we will be willing to give an opinion, but it's just an opinion. When it comes to BDSM and the law, we are not here to offer you advice other than talk to Call someone. Call an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Call an attorney. Talk to somebody who knows 
Uh, you can find BDSM friendly professionals out there. In fact, the NCSF on their website has a section where you can put in your location and try to find somebody, whether it be an attorney, a physician, a therapist, whatever the case mm-hmm. may be. So that's really cool that that resource exists. Now, it's not extremely thorough yet, but give it a try if you need it. And uh, I believe that pretty much takes care of BDSM in the law, correct? Yes, it does. All right. So a few uh, final housekeeping notes. I'd like to thank our executive producer, Jeremiah, our senior producer, Matt, and our junior producers, K2SO. Irish Mountain Dragon, that's Fun Size's very own husband, and The Accidental Trucker. If you would like to become one of our show producers, go to our website, cauldronscript.com, click on the Support Us tab to get information on how to do that. Next, I'd like to thank BDSMcontracts.org for their donation of those 25-page soft and hardbound MS and DS contracts that we mentioned earlier. That's BDSMcontracts.org. Use the coupon code CAULDRIN20, K-U-L-D-R-I-N-2-0, for a 20% discount off of all purchases. And finally, Whipping Stripes, whippingstripes.com. They are my personal maker of all things leather and paracord when it comes to my impact toys. I don't get anything for saying that. I just absolutely love them. They make amazing toys and they are the most inexpensive company out there, which is why I don't have a coupon code for you, but their quality is top notch. So that's Whipping Stripes dot com and links to all of this is in the show notes cauldronscript.com slash 137 next week on the crypt we're going to talk about dungeon paperwork if you've never been to a dungeon or if you've only been to one this is going to be an important episode for you to check out get into the whys the what's the wins and the wares of all that dungeon paperwork. In the meantime, go to cauldronscript.com for show notes, how to subscribe information, and the link to our FetLife group so you can take part in the conversation and be eligible for giveaways. While you're there, click on the Support Us tab to become a Patreon supporter known as one of our producers. You can find a full list of the rest of our contact info there as well. This has been Master Cauldron and Fun Size for cauldronscript.com. Unearth the truth.